Hello and welcome everyone. This is Taco Movie Talks. I'm joined here with Matt. Matt, how are you doing? We're talking about Nicholas Rogue. Um, let us know what you've been up to and I guess how you were introduced to Nicholas Rogue, the director. Um, so I'm doing well. Um, and I first found Nicholas Rogue's movies. Um, I think it was another Criterion uh, closet video because I, I just watched a lot of those for a long time. And someone chose Walkabout, and I thought it looked interesting. And uh, I watched it, and I thought it was very unique and different. Um, and then I think I watched Don't Look Now and Performance after that, and I liked Performance the most. But it, it his movies... They really were, were great in terms of their visuals, and that's why I kept going back. So these are the, the first two movies I've watched from Rogue, and I have to agree, like, with your initial sentiment is definitely something I share. I thought visually he has a very vibrant color palette that he uses where things really jump off the screen. It's very visually appealing, and uh, it certainly makes me want to continue to watch him in the future. Um, and I feel like you're you're very much, Matt, ahead of the curve. And anyone watching, if you're aware of Rogue, I feel like you're ahead of the curve too. Because despite how much I enjoyed these two movies we're going to talk about, the popularity of Don't Look Now, which is considered a horror classic, probably a cult classic... His name wasn't ever like it, like the way John Carpenter is linked to Halloween or uh, William Friedkin is linked to The Exorcist. Uh, you know, Nicholas Rogue isn't the director that is immediately linked with Don't Look Now, yet he has such a distinctive style. He feels like an auteur. And he's definitely really good at his craft. Um, This was a question that I threw out to you earlier this week. And uh, have you, you know, have you put any more thought into why he hasn't quite maybe got the full recognition he deserves? Yeah, because... Well, it's interesting that he, he seems to maybe recently have come back a little just because I saw his stuff featured in on the Criterion channel, um, and I hadn't before. But I don't know how much that translates into you know a wider audience knowing about him. But it, I feel like he, from the directors we've recently been talked uh, been discussing, he reminded me of. Uh, Peck and Paw just because of the editing was so uh, so much a central part of the film. So I feel like maybe if he was uh, making films in America rather in the UK, he might be more known over here just because uh, these like, like performance was like with Warner Brothers. You know, obviously it's probably not what they were were planning to get from from the movie, but. It, it, he had like big, you know, production studios backing his stuff. So it is interesting that he never quite blew up. And maybe that's just because of how unique his, his movies are. One thing uh, you mentioned, which I think has a pretty neat backstory, um, is that performance was actually shelved for two years prior to its release. And it's because of how unique a story it is. Were you aware of that, Matt? And I guess, um, are you are you slightly surprised by that? Yeah, I was aware of it a little. I didn't read up on it as much as some. I, I do other production things, like like for Heaven's Gate, but. Um, I knew that, and you can kind of tell from the movie too. You know, there's stuff like how the ending doesn't really make a lot of sense and how it kind of feels like partly a gangster film, partly some kind of like psychedelic hippie film that 
there was a lot of clash probably in the editor's room or what they should cut out and what they should keep and how to actually make the movie work probably because the director because there are two directors listed on letterboxd the movie i'm not really sure i'm not very familiar with the other guy but you know with two directors and fighting with the studio throughout the making of the whole movie there's probably they, they you know the studio is probably saying things like you have to keep this and this in there and then that didn't quite make the whole movie come together correctly the the one thing that i did notice just looking at the crew um like you said there was two directors and then i think there was also two additional directors and uh you know a few films will have those additional directors um and i i guess just to probably give additional input um help out on set i don't know i'm sure their role changes from set to set like and kind of fill in where needed but i think the most distinctive thing that stuck out to me was the fact that for performance nicholas rogue was the cinematographer and there was a lot of brilliance in that film but I mean, the thing that you stated that I also really noticed was that the cinematography for performance was uh, one of the highlights of that film. And I, and I think um, perhaps the reason Rogue saw continual success following that film is not only probably his history, but also because he had an eye for just creating those brilliant shots. Yeah, because I also think that that movie, The Man Who Fell to Earth, with David Bowie in it, you know, that's definitely probably a pretty well-known movie back in the 70s. You know, even if you didn't know, they didn't know the director at all, the fact that David Bowie was in it, just like, you know, how Mick Jagger was in this movie, probably attracted people. And, you know, maybe the fact that it was shelved for a couple of years, like you mentioned, hurt its release and... uh what it potentially could have been but this it's interesting that this is also his fav his first film as a director or performances he before he did cinematography for other movies so i guess that kind of uh shines through in what he's going for which is mostly it's like visuals first and everything else second which is something that i've like come to learn over my, my years of watching movies is kind of like what I like enjoy the most just because I think it's most memorable for me. Yeah. It's, um, and I, I was gonna, you know, make a definitive statement, but I think it, it would definitely change, especially like how you actually, how storytelling works in your mind but because if i were to say definitively cinematography seems like that would be the most difficult part for a person like nicholas rogue might kind of turn their head and say I, I don't really think so like that's the piece i can most easily associate with and imagine and then just put it on screen but um it is probably one of the most hard, you know, the hardest thing to execute. Um, and, and working with the actual set design feels like a really set design and makeup, I think are really the strong aspects that completely tie together his style because, uh, the, the vibrance of his shots are what kept me so engaged, I think. Because it, it just... He had scenes that look like paintings, which is something that is you know said time and time again whenever I, I read reviews. But uh, the colors just... They really they leapt off the screen. And I really appreciate when directors do that. Um, I want to throw something your way, Matt. Because I, I, I have one that... I feel he's 
you know, not the same as, but I feel like there's a little bit of a flavor that is similar to this person. Are there any directors, I know you said Peck and Paw, would he be the one you would most closely relate him to, or do any others kind of come to mind for you? Well, um, it reminds me of kind of French New Wave-ish, like not with the editing, but just with kind of the way the visuals oftentimes like take prominence over a story or the story's kind of like not uh not very focused i guess the best way to say it Mm. um but you know for other directors i just think of of uh directors that are the most focused on cinematography in general so like oftentimes like uh like godard we've talked about how he's very you know another one of my favorites harmony corinne there there there's a lot of uh just like focus on i guess cinematography but like in terms of his stories you know he's kind of all over the place um like i watched another movie by him this week just because i felt like watching another one of his films it called bad timing and it was just kind of about like a abusive love relationship so you know all these films like they're kind of all about very different things. So it's hard to pinpoint um, anything that's consistent except maybe his, his visual style and the way he also kind of goes back and forth in time, I guess you could say, uh, or like another thing I noticed was like how you would sometimes like hear character voices, at least in um, don't look now. Um, and also I think in that bad timing movie I watched that, that, that was more like their thoughts, just, just, he does cool things with sound too. Uh, just kind of his whole, I guess, present, uh, his whole style of presenting the films is kind of similar amongst each one. One director, and I have to preface this because it's, it's definitely not a one-to-one comparison, but. I couldn't help but think of Alejandro Hodorowski, uh, especially when watching performance. Um, and the psychedelic scenes definitely aided in that. And I have to say, Rogue definitely has a more straightforward narrative that is more accessible and easier to follow than a Hodorowski movie. But he definitely falls you know, somewhere on that spectrum of like a psychedelic style very much taking place. And, and I think, um, and maybe you would agree, Matt, there's even a bit of that in don't look now. Um, and it's, you know, it's not inspired by drug sequences, but, uh, like doubting, doubting reality in a sense. And the way that he's able to visually depict that uh, feels like there is a bit of a Hodorowski flair. And what makes it interesting is that they were, you know, these films and, you know, some of the most popular Hodorowski films I've seen, uh, both, all of them coming out at the kind of same time period. Yeah, that's actually that. I think that's a perfect uh way to connect it because i didn't think of that but as you were saying it i was thinking how similar they are especially in the whole doubting reality aspect which i think is there for performance and don't look now and uh in the holy mountain which is the one movie i think i've seen from him i can't remember if i've seen another one but um but yeah, I, I feel like also the way maybe things are montaged or edited together is similar in The Holy Mountain is, and also performance. Um, one thing I was, I was thinking about while you were saying that too was that scene where the paint, the red paint is going everywhere and it's, I thought it was kind of blood. That reminded me, for, for whatever reason, of Jodorowsky. I think while I was watching it, I, I just didn't recall uh thinking about that and that is uh 
and uh, this is a bit of a side tangent, but I want to wrap it back into uh, Nicholas Rogue. But I feel like spaghetti westerns um, and Peck and Paw, which he feels very much inspired by spaghetti westerns, despite uh, conflicting like analysis that I've heard on him. But one of the reason reasons I love those movies and the violence that you see in those movies is that that vibrant blood look it's like it it's it makes it more like artistic looking um and you know it doesn't quite take you out of the moment i mean you know you're watching a movie when you see the red blood i guess but it that is like the most eye-catching color and it feels like it's you know i i've noticed this as well when we watched um scarface and blowout uh de palma seems to love that red color and i I think nicholas rogue definitely has a really a good bit of that as well like the daughter the 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 rain jacket and don't look now and then even the hair color of the the leading character and performance and then splashed throughout the entire movie it's a, it's like a really eye catching color and it's definitely one that they they like to kind of keep on the movie palette throughout you know what i'm saying yeah yeah i have a uh that's an interesting thought and i've also you know kind of noticed that and whenever i see blood that doesn't look real it does it i I don't think like cartoonish is the right word because it doesn't like take you out of thinking the movie's real but it definitely does feel more artistic i think the time it stood out to me the most was i guess besides this movie it would be this uh i think it was maybe bresson movie and it was uh, about like Uh, medieval knights and i think for some reason you know if like a head gets cut off with a sword or something in a medieval movie and the blood is like super red instead of realistic that just fits for me for whatever reason so yeah i i I know what you're talking about and i think uh uh, i don't know it's it's pretty interesting i i think if if i were to label it i would say it feels more stylized yeah yeah i think that's a better term for it and you you mentioned something that I think is uh, both, I would imagine, has its own unique challenges on sets, but would possibly be a really big attraction, especially for this time period. And it's having literal rock stars in your film. Mick Jagger and um, David Bowie, who... Um, you know, if, if my timing is, if it's correct in my head, um, I mean, the, both of them were pretty much like megastars as things were, were released. And at least speaking for performance, and you can speak for, uh, I think it's The Man Who Fell to Earth. Uh, is that the correct title with the David Bowie? Yeah. Yeah. Mick Jagger was, he was, he felt like a very natural performer, which for some people that may be a surprise or not surprising whatsoever, but he, he stole a lot of the scenes he was in. Honestly, he was, he used the, the, the presence as this world renowned performer, but was able to capture it on film and, I would imagine there would be so many, like, just being able to capture that correctly in the hands of a, a director who wouldn't know how to do that. I mean, it would be nearly impossible. But uh, I, I give Rogue and the other director and the additional directors a lot of credit for, for being able to pull that off. Yeah, I was. Uh... I read some, I think it was an interview with some of the people that worked on performance and they were mentioning how, you know, excited Mick Jagger was to 
perform and how he would even tried to start, I think, method acting slightly for the role. So it's definitely something he wanted to do. And, you know, I think of stars now or like someone like Justin Timberlake who wanted to, you know, be a movie star. I think for a lot of them, maybe they just get attracted to, uh, you know, being in a film. I think a lot of like artistic people that, you know, are really good musicians also tend to love like good movies too. And, you know, he was also taking a huge risk, I think, because this was Rogue's first like feature film. Like he had done cinematography, but he never directed. And, I, but I think, you know, I don't know a lot about Mick Jagger as a person, but I think that he seemed to maybe also been like this in real life. And he was kind of just playing an exaggerated version of himself. Uh, but I, truly love his character in this movie and i think i think i told you before that he's like to eat to me he feels like someone like unhuman kind of like like he's he's like a being in the movie that's like feels like kind of spiritual ish so he like does a really good job in my opinion yeah he he does uh, an absolutely tremendous job and uh before i i forget this i don't know if you picked up on any additional ones or if you notice this um but throughout the movie i noticed there was like uh allusions to two of mick jagger's like very famous songs and there could have been more but you know when the 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 room was red he was painting it black, which is making an allusion to the very famous Rolling Stones song, Paint It Black. And then there was another time where I think he was taking a bath, and on a dinner table there was brown sugar on the table, which again is an allusion to one of the Rolling Stones' most popular songs, Brown Sugar. Did you notice that, and was there any additional ones that you caught? I noticed the painted black one, um, just because I used to like. I mean, I like that song, and uh, but I did not notice any others. But I'll I'll just say one comment that after I watched this movie the first time, I started listening to more like the Rolling Stones songs uh, that were kind of I guess alluded to in the movie. And and the different, it, it just made me like it more, even though that's not typically the type of music I listen to. I just kind of got more interested. So uh, a good soundtrack overall for the movie, in my opinion. Yes. And uh, and, I, and I, I'm going to throw in, a th I would assume you could make, this is more of a stretch. Those are like kind of ob more obvious ones that I feel definitively were like, you know, direct allusions. The fact that the main character was trying to live in that, you know, basement, studio, apartment, whatever, uh, that could also be another illusion to give me shelter. But the, um, the live, or not live performance, but the actual song where you're in the psychedelic trip and uh, Mick Jagger, his character is singing in the movie. That was like another like really great performance. Both and it, and I think it illustrated really great acting. And then obviously, what we know to be true before even coming into the movie, which is that you know Mick Jagger is obviously a great performer when it comes to musical performances as well. I enjoyed that. I, I'm assuming you did as well, Matt. Yeah, I love that part. That's one of my favorite parts. Um, and in a way, that's like the climax of the movie, which you like wouldn't... I mean, you could argue it is. And, and I mean, you wouldn't really expect that from like the first 30 minutes. With this movie, I think um, the narrative is fairly straightforward. And... I was really, really excited to 
kind of talk about like trying to get to the deeper meaning of of this film um but before we get there i'll kind of lay out the story beats just so everyone's on the same page and it, it starts with a i'll say a a british slash cockney gangster um kind of has a hot head and ends up taking things too far to where now the gang that his he is in is after him because he's brought unwanted attention to their illicit activities because there was kind of an understanding where they almost self police but he ends up murdering a another gangster which is kind of now they're going to have police all over their tail and in trying to elude his own gang he ends up setting up shop in the same building as Mick Jagger's character who is kind of this I don't want to say washed up but retired rock star and that's I would say the main beats of the movie um anything worth adding to the to the summary map um the only thing I could think is I I think he was uh, the gangster or the main the main character, not Mick Jagger, was trying to leave, like flee the country, correct? Yes, yes, that is okay. a, a very valid point. He, um, I think, he gets in contact with his cousin in an attempt to flee to America, and and he's staying with Mick Jagger in the meantime, while he's getting all of the paperwork and tickets and whatnot uh, set up. To me, yeah. this film is trying to present uh, Mick Jagger, a very central character, especially in the second half, and the gangster as sort of like flip sides of the same coin. And is that sort of the way you saw it as well, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I think that one poster for the movie says like vice and versa i think they're supposed to be opposites where you know just like their whole attitude and their way of viewing like how to or like uh, their moral values i guess you could say or like how they want to live their life is completely you know opposite i i agree with that um i i also they are so diametrically opposed that um, as the movie kind of progresses and we, we get into the, the, the scene in which our main character, the gangster, is drugged with mushrooms, it kind of pulls him closer to Mick Jagger's ideologies and, and way of life. And it started to almost leave me with a perspective that I got when I watched Ingmar Bergman's Persona. Um, did you kind of have that feeling as well? Um, and, and do you think Rogue's per like, what do you think Rogue's purpose was behind that if you did see it that way as well? Yeah, um, I think just, you know, from seeing all of Rose films that he, you know, would obviously side more, I guess, in his own mind with Mick Jagger's character. And so in a way it's like, he's trying to, this is just how I perceived it. He's like trying to open that, the ga gangsters eyes to, I guess, his way of life and living and how uh, it's just a lot of those like sixties hippies thing kind of themes um for for viewing life like extremely carefree and you know just kind of like drug you know drug use was very big and they were doing that all you know tripping on uh psychedelics and also the whole you know view they had on sex i thought was a big theme how they were kind of in a way all kind of wore the same clothes and just you know 
like did s sexual things with each other and, and they it's like they didn't care if if you were a male or a female there's this very like carefree attitude about life that i think uh rogue was trying to somehow mix in there with this like hard gangster uh way of life and maybe he's trying to say that you know the hippie way is better but like i, I don't think you can really come to that conclusion definitely yeah I, one of the the main takeaways or, or i guess like the the through line or f like lasting impression that i was left with in trying to interpret this because it feels like there's a lot you can dig into is that only tr like one of these ideologies can be you can only live with one of these ideologies and getting into the ending I think it's like um, to survive the gangster had to kind of eliminate that that part of himself because he he let it bleed into who he was almost like his genetic makeup this kind of carefree creative hippie type persona and um, as he was going to embark on maybe you could argue his most difficult mission to stay alive after what he had done he needed to be the hardened criminal a hundred percent and couldn't let that piece of him continue to exist. And that was kind of the way that I justified the really kind of impactful moment with Mick Jagger in this film. Uh, and that was like the, the way that I tried to make sense of it in my head. Um, any thoughts on that? Does that resonate with you at all? Yeah, so like kind of the way I guess I see his the gangster characters like arc in general is like he you see him starting out and he's you know obviously he's kind of a crappy guy like threatening you know, feathering people or whatever they were doing um like do you know what before I go on do you know what they were doing to those people I know it was some kind of protection service but oh um yeah, uh, like the actual. Yeah, it looked like they might have been. Tar I don't know if they tarred and tarring. feathered him, but they had the feathers. Yeah. I just assumed they were tarring and feathering him. Okay, so yeah, either way, it was you know it was kind of just freaky and weird. Um, but but yeah, so he you know when he goes from that and it's kind of like he you know they turn on him or he turns on them and. Uh, whatever he has to leave his life and so he kind of like i'd say like maybe loses his identity a little bit or it's like he's starting over and i think you're right in saying that he, you know he's at that point and he can't he can't get rid of his like gangster persona but it, it's but like Mick Jagger's like trying to change him like at first Mick Jagger wants him out but like over time he starts to seem to to develop like you know he he wants to uh be able to change this guy from this attitude he has to like i guess people would say like oh like open your eyes you know like realize like what what's really important and and things like that like that that's kind of Mick Jagger's uh goal um but also i think you know, people that are usually more, you know, cause I've, I'm not like super hippie myself, but I definitely, uh, adopt a lot of the ideologies I'd say that Mick Jagger's character has and like what he believes. Um, but anyways, uh, so I just think that he's just trying to maybe open it him up or it, in in the sense to lose all of his uh like negative attitudes and like ways he treats people because i don't know it's just it's it's hard to explain kind of because it's like all you have to go into talk about like psychedelics or you know how they affect and change people and so you're kind of 
just seeing a transformation of a person, I guess, to put it simply. That, I think that is a valid point. And I do think, um, like you said, the not only the drug culture, but how like psychedelics operate as a whole had a very kind of big impact to the, mm-hmm. I'll call it movie psychology. Um, but one thing that it seemed, it was a detail that I believe I was I picked out that I think is an interesting piece to discuss is that, and I don't know whether this was like an illusion as a metaphor, but that Mick Jagger's character had to, he was described to almost be a type of gangster like previously in life. Now was I did I correctly pick up on that or was that more like almost using like an allegory to try to get a point across to the actual main character? Um do you do you recall that? I don't exactly remember. Uh, I remember him, you know, talking about his past life and and making songs, but I, what part are you talking about? At at one point they were speaking about, um, and it was a part of the reason that Mick Jagger retired, is that he was, he would he would describe himself as like a demon, previously, in that he lost that part of himself, and that's why he retired, um, and almost mm-hmm. in a way, that's where like there there seems to be like almost little cookie crumbs that make me think and it doesn't work perfectly logically but I still it's a thread I'm pulling at is that Mick Jagger and the gangster character are the same person yeah so so that's what you're trying to get at with like the persona maybe or yeah. fight club team yeah, you know, that's an interesting perspective. Uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. It's I, I do think it. Like, I guess I just saw it differently. I guess I saw it more like when when he was. Uh, I, I guess I did perceive it as when he was telling um, the gangster character that that he was uh, that that in a way they were talking about how they performed and acted differently in different situations. And I like kept thinking of, uh, it it was strange how they kept referring to him, you know, how they said he, he was there to be a juggler. And it's as if like they knew he really wasn't that the whole time, Mm -hmm. but they kept referring to him as that anyways. And in my mind, I was thinking like, these people, it's like maybe none of them. Another point I thought the movie was trying to make, and this is, you know, this could just be completely uh, just my view, but I thought they were trying to say, like, you can perform as all these different types of people in your life. Like, you can act, you know, like a gangster, or you can, like, they'll take acid a bunch and become this other person. Um, that was kind of my perspective. I don't think either of them are right or wrong. I think it's interesting how we could take, because I don't think yours is, I don't think the persona uh, viewpoint is like incorrect. I think, you know, thinking about that movie and that lens now, I think that could be completely what it is, how he's one person and he's fighting, you know, both these sides for, he wants to stay, you know, in his, uh, you know, whatever job he does, his mafia job, then the other part of him wants to, you know, go be a hippie. Maybe he was before, like you said, maybe Mick Jagger saying that could have meant that, you know, before he be joined this gang, he was way more easygoing. And now he has to have this hard attitude. It's just a lot of, uh, a lot of different perspectives and ideas. I think it's pretty interesting. It makes this movie pretty good. I agree. I, I think like, hearing your perspective, I, I really enjoy it because 
um, just timeline wise, the pieces that I couldn't, they were like things I couldn't really make the mental gymnastics work for was how Mick Jagger had established relationships with people prior to the gangster coming in and, and ditto for the gangster. And it's just like, how could they both establish these deep, meaningful relationships if they were the same person? Um, I, I feel like you, I think you hit the nail on the head in that Mick Jagger is trying to illuminate and by proxy, Nick Rogue is trying to illuminate that they are parallels and going back to like literally the title of the film, how you do, like you said, you act uh, like what you want to be. And then to outside perspective, everyone's perspective, you are that thing. Um, and obviously the better you are at faking it, the more successful people are going to, you know, have that perspective of you. But that, like, Jagger is trying to say, yeah, I like to, I used to be like you. I was committed to this facade, perhaps, of being a rock star. But he describes it as what the gangster is at that very moment. So he said, I was a demon who had stripes. And he was quite literally explaining what the gangster looked like at that time because you know he was this this guy who obviously did bad things was in a physical altercation and had been whipped and it looked like he had stripes on his back and uh it was like he was kind of playing with his mind and using him as the analogy without coming right out and saying it yeah, there's, and, and you know that you kind of got me thinking of like other moments now where he's kind of talking about being someone else. Like I, I remember he's he dresses up like the the gangster character when he take, takes the mushrooms. He dresses up and he doesn't really look like himself anymore, and so he's kind of changing again to like I guess you could say perform as another type of person and then Mick Jagger comes out dressed up in this whole new like outfit with a hat on I can't remember like what the exact style is but then he starts saying something about juggling or how he's a juggler and and it's just like and then there's the other layer of of this performance thing where you, the girls are talking about how Mick Jagger can be a male or a female and and she's I remember at one point she's asking the gangster like how you know if you'd want to do different things like if if they were a male or if they were a female and all these I mean at the time definitely pretty progressive or I mean I mean now it's more commonplace but it's just kind of I guess in an, another layer of like sexual performance like how you can maybe act different or be somewhat completely different in that aspect so there's just a lot of like these i guess yin and yang isn't the right word but kind of like the the whole idea where it's it's like an array it, like there's not just two things there's there's all sorts of uh choices or things you can choose to be and i think the the script choice of the gangster pretending to be a juggler, which I thought was hilarious when I first heard that was his cover story because that is like... <laughs> they, they, if someone told me they were a famous juggler, I would never believe them in a million years. So I don't know, like, it, you know, and it, but it, it works for how it is metaphorically to say... He has to keep up this facade of being a gangster when he talks to the like the people who know him as that. But then he also has to pretend to be a more creative type and fully uh, ingratiate himself into that whole subculture. Um, and I mean, I think we mentioned it, but it I, it shouldn't I, I shouldn't go without saying like these two subcultures are. Uh, very just so far apart so to have them kind of smashed together 
in a film like this is really interesting to see. Um, and on top of that, just th- I-, I feel like to bring to your point, it's like there was that constant trying to juggle his his sexuality, his facades, his identity. Um, uh, both were like everything about that I found really, really interesting. Yeah, it's like it, it it's like you would never think a, the gangster and hippie combination could work at all. And I think that that's just the aspect where this movie is probably confusing for you know people and it takes a long time to kind of harmonize and come together. I would say the best part of the movie is like when you're in when we're getting into the midst of the gangster and Mick Jagger together, like when they're he gives him the mushrooms. That kind of part is where you kind of start to see maybe why you know the the whole gangster part and first part was important. You know, your initial thought is that this is going to be you know a typical gangster flick where he's he's trying to get away from them and you know stuff's going to happen but it's it's as if that stuff doesn't matter anymore and it becomes this like heightened kind of like psychedelic type of experience uh and and like it, that's just hard to often take away from movies like it's hard to get a like meaningful message i would say just because like you know for most people what are you going to take away from that? I think one review I, I read said that like if you know, you're involved in the hippie lifestyle or like a drug user, this movie's like a lot more easy to like understand or something like that. Or, uh, yeah, it's just like kind of the, I guess you would say like the vibe of the movie. Yeah. I, I, well, because, um, I think innately audiences, I like, you know, mature audiences that are going to be watching this movie probably have a lot of exposure to gangster movies. And uh, you're, you're just, despite not having like any real life experience in a gang or what have you, you, you have like a little bit of an understanding just from being constantly exposed to it in film. You know, some of my favorite films are, are crime and gangster films. So you already kind of understand some of the inner mechanisms of what is going on with those relationships. But um, like my exposure, whether it be real life or through cinema to this kind of subculture is semi limited, uh, mostly because of the time period that, you know, you and I grew up, Matt, but also geographically and just, I mean, I don't know, I, I it, probably a lot chance, too, that, you know, I never picked up on the, the more, like, hippie aesthetic or ideological movies. So, to me, that was the more challenging element to to kind of make sense of with this movie. Yeah. Yeah. Like we didn't like by the time period we grew up, you know, you're right. Like gangsters weren't really or, or around in the same kind of way they were then. And, you know, even though this is, you know, in the UK, they're still kind of resemble, you know, like the Italian gangsters that were so prominent in the United States. And we also, you know, we have our own version of, hippies now and there's always kind of a version of that now in in culture but it's not at all like the 60s so it is a little harder i'd say for us to relate to just the culture but also part of the reason i love the movie is because the decor i would say like that 60s hippie decor with the tapestries and stuff mostly referring to like Mick Jagger's house it's one of the coolest sets I've seen in a while just it it feels like it's real too like it's like a comfy place but it's so decorative and just very unique yeah that like if you were to tell me that 
they just showed up at like a place Mick Jagger, like one of his many uh, abodes, I would definitely believe it. <laughs> it looked like yeah, yeah. It looked like it had been lived in, you know. Yeah, yeah. I um, I think the part that you know I I was beginning to kind of explain my thought process towards but I would love to get kind of like your interpretation to is the, I guess the very big point in the movie, which if you haven't seen, I would skip forward a little bit, like a minute or two, but it is the point in which the gangster is uh, surrounded in the house. And he says, I'm going to go and get my gun. And then he shoots Mick Jagger which I found to be surprising. And like as it unraveled, I couldn't make sense of it at the time, but it was the lasting impression that made me try to think, of, like, you know, it kept this film in my mind afterwards. What's your interpretation for that decision, I guess? Like, honestly... It's so hard to understand what it means. I was trying to think about that, and I don't know. Maybe, like, my best idea would just be that he didn't, he, he just wanted to get rid of, I guess, that whole. It's as if he, like, he had lost his identity with the Jagger, and then, like, he decided he didn't want to anymore or that it didn't really change him because I don't know with the rest of the movie. I just don't, I I don't understand it. I don't, what do you think? Yeah. I think, uh, like, like you had mentioned the, the only thing that could make sense to me because on the face of it, Mick Jagger wasn't really a negative person. And, uh, I mean, he would have been in that situation kind of no matter what. And he probably would have died sooner if not for him being drugged by Mick Jagger. Um, so it's not like he's someone to blame. He shouldn't really have a, a type. He didn't have any real antagonistic relationship with him. It just seems like that is supposed to symbolize a an inner death, I guess, is the best way I can describe it, in that he is now realizing I cannot be that, which is what I was with Mick Jagger, which is pretty much directly in line with what you were saying. Uh, that's the, the most sense I can make out of it. Yeah, and, you know, that just made me think that Part of the reason maybe why the ending didn't make sense for me is from my my perspective of the movie. Lot like, like like if it is or isn't the persona, you know, if they are or aren't the same person. And thinking about it now, if you assume they are and it is more like persona, then the ending it, it works perfectly. You know what I mean? Like it, it it makes sense then because it's like he is getting rid of that part of himself, but at the same time. I would have thought, you know, the way Rogue portrayed Mick Jagger and his world, and also this just being like, seeming like a kind of a promotion of that rock and roll hippie culture in general, that the gangster character would end up winning out in the end. Mm. I agree. I, You know, maybe this was also like kind of an additional point that made it harder for me to wrap my mind around is that he didn't murder either of the two women either and they feel like Mick Jagger is obviously like the embodiment of that but those two are also like important elements of the hippie culture as well and that was like a, a distinct decision creatively that I wasn't sure why he didn't do that. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Like, that's why I honestly think the ending, 
like even though I I give this movie like full rating, like I still it it like I don't like the ending. I wish it was different because like it it just adds a ton of confusion onto the top of like the whole trip experience and feeling like he's like he's a transforming or you know if you assume they're the same person like he's getting rid of maybe like a, the darker side of him or he's becoming more free or uh, open-minded but then you know he doesn't he, he just kills Mick Jagger he doesn't you know you could say he doesn't get rid of the whole like those the two girls and the whole culture itself but then it leaves you questioning at the end like what was the purpose of it yeah, and and from some of the reviews that I read as well, um, some of the sentiments being made seem to point into the direction that um, culturally the gangster slash organized criminal it almost... It's very representative of greed, I guess you could say, in that in a society, that segment is naturally at odds with the kind of more hippie ideology. And if they are to ever kind of battle, it would be, it, I guess, natural for the... I guess the gangster to cannibalize the, the hippie. And, and, and I don't know if I did a, a great job of explaining that, but does that resonate with you at all, Matt? Yeah, that does make sense. You know, from that, from that point of view, um, it makes sense because if you thought, you know, have them fight, you know, who would win? Well, definitely, you know, the gangster characters. And they're also, you, you could say that then, you know, the part of the message of the movie is how, I, I guess like in a cliche way, like bad evil, like overcomes good all, most of the time, maybe just because they're willing to, you know, take measures that are illegal or frowned upon to get what they want. So, you know, and in, in the end they'll win out. So yeah, that is, that's definitely, I'd say like a, 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 a way to make it look at the movie that makes it make more sense. And uh, like, if, if we're to, um, like s go that direction full bore, um, do you, would you extrapolate rogues meaning, um, on a deeper level that it's like almost a, not a forewarning for the hippie culture, but like, Hey, there's signs on the wall that, you know, the the sentiment in Britain and uh, America are are probably going to extinguish what perhaps rogue and obviously people within the hippie subculture, they feel to be a great thing in that uh, the, the spirit can easily be kind of overshadowed or overall kind of killed for lack of a better term which and like you said i mean there are still there, you know there's modern day hippies but it's it's had to evolve and change and certainly what we would consider to be hippies from that time period i think you even said it straight up is that they they don't th this type of person really doesn't exist anymore um and it's like culture killed the the hippie in a way, and it's like rogues for foreshadowing that. Yeah, I think that's possible because when I think of the endings to his other films, none of them are really um, like happy or you know, they don't really give you a lot of hope. I guess for the characters or for what the movie's saying, they kind of all end, you know, on a. With, with what we would generally call a bad a, a bad ending, not like that it's made bad poorly, but that it's like not a happy ending. So yeah, I think maybe he's you know worried that or that culture will be threatened or 
he's you know i'm not sure if he himself was kind of more a hippier type of of guy but i'm sure that he you know working with the rock stars he did and you know mick jagger and david bowie that he probably and also just like the way his movies are made and how trippy they are he probably subscribed to that mentality himself so uh, you know he also could have just um one he 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 may have if you know we talk go back to the production aspect of the movie he may have wanted to you know make it indifferently or uh, and he just wasn't able to or that's the only way he could make it work with the other director i think he the important part to him was getting those ideas in in the uh you know part of the movie with Mick Jagger and the gangster character interacting um i i i don't know if you know he fully um had intentions of of the movie ending in 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 some way but i guess for the what we have you could say that he he could have been he could have been envisioning the downfall of the of that culture i want to i i guess take a step back from the movie um i i'll start it off like with the the tie which is obviously and you were kind of speaking to this which is the uh the ambiguity of Mick Jagger's character um in this film and and how the significance to that in the film but I also I want to speak to I guess or ask you the question what do you think was the attraction to that for audiences of that time period? Um, and it's funny, I'm going to use two of the actors that Nicholas Rogue used as prime examples, where we have a Mick Jagger type, and then we have um, <clears throat> David Bowie as well, which were just mega stars and heartthrobs for millions and millions of women. Uh, Another one is Prince, where, I mean, they literally blended the line of sexuality, and yet uh, it was alluring for female audiences. Um, I I guess I just want to ask you, like, how do you think that like the what do you think the psychology is behind that and what makes that so alluring do you think it uh that's not the main draw of it and that there's other aspects that make it make them so alluring or do you think that is a a, a very that plays a big role i guess yeah i think a, a couple things i think like one or the first thing is like this increase in use of like psychedelic drugs in general and uh and the second thing is uh, it's like a the if you think about the 50s you know it, like american 50s culture and how it was you know it's very like fetishized today but it's like you, know, you think how it was like morally correct and i'm like there wasn't a lot of uh, like super violent media or there wouldn't be movies that that talked about like sexual themes like this and then you have the 60s which is like a, a counterculture time and it's you know there's these ban- bands that are all incredibly popular and they all wear you know their hair long you know or they have like hair like the Beatles or people like Bob Dylan and Pink Floyd and the Grateful Dead, and it's it's like these. Um, it it's just interesting. Like I, I, I guess the best way to describe would be like how different cultural movements happen, and people start dressing differently, doing their hair differently, and you know, just to to try and say why that blew up, it's probably so many things, and it's it would be uh, it's fun to talk about, but I pinning it to like i think we just have to talk more maybe about the movement as a whole to try and get an idea of maybe why uh these things were so popular to and and why you know women for example like started loving guys like this i 
I think in your explanation, you, you, when you said the fetishization or that kind of sprung like an epiphany in that I feel as though that, you know, they had a masculine energy on stage, which made them attractive, but also the fact that they dressed and had hair and even would do makeup in, in, you know, the, the cases I mentioned was in and of itself taboo. And that created a greater allure. Um, and like, it, it's fun, like not funny, but interesting how that continued to evolve. I mean, there was a whole brand of rock slash metal um called hair metal where or glam metal uh or glam glam rock and hair metal where uh you know their the appearance of the band was such a huge aspect and you look at the 60s and you look at the 70s into the 80s uh man there was probably 90 percent had long hair and people with short like 50s type haircuts were like almost nowhere to be seen so it's it's literally i mean it is counterculture and going against the norms that becomes like this act of um you know fighting what is culturally accepted and thus becomes taboo and i think oftentimes you see culturally something that you're not supposed to do uh, can become something that you uh, is easy to like obsess over for, for either gender. Yeah. I think, you know, another popular thing and it's, and, and a lot of times it's people will just say, well, you know, it's hard to get hired for a job if you have, you know, certain things and it, was probably true with long hair back in the 60s but now it's more like when people want to dye their hair like you know a bright color like a bright green or something um you know or you know getting a face tattoo that's another thing now uh that's very you know and and we don't really see it as they're they're we just uh, like i'd say it's counterculture for sure because in the future we're going to look back and and think about what was like the counterculture, more edgy movement of the time. And we'll probably think of SoundCloud rappers and, and face tattoos, at least for like the 2010s. Um, but yeah, it's just these interesting edgy type um, counterculture movements. Um, and I think at that time, that was kind of the thing, you know, I unfortunately never got to live during the seventies, but, uh, or, or the sixties, but I think it was a, a, a neat time and i think that this movie kind of evokes a lot of what that time period stand, stood for both in the uk and in america absolutely uh matt i want to ask you any specific aspects um that you also want to highlight about performance um hmm I talked about just about everything. I I mean, we talked about the visuals initially, but uh, and and I and I'd say we could talk about this aspect of his filmmaking more in Don't Look Now, but the the way he cuts around, I think, uh, is is like like in the Peck and Paw way, how it'll flash to, um, well, like how it flashed to Mick Jagger's character, like five to ten minutes before he was living in the film things like that like it's just like a a short cut of like a second or half a second um and and things like that I, when i'm watching the film is when I, I it really gets me engaged and keeps me interested in the film and i i really like like that part of uh rogue's filmmaking and, and it stands out in performance yeah it's almost like uh like a nudge through the 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 television set uh just like hey just making making sure you're still there making sure you're still engaged making sure you're still paying attention it's uh i I like that element being used especially the way he used it and it keeps you on your toes as an audience member i think 
Yeah, yeah, and and it's it's cool that he, it's such on display in this. It's, it's for his first, you know, feature. But uh, but yeah, it's great. Matt, I want to ask you. I think you alluded to it already, but uh, I want to ask what is your rating and any final thoughts. Oh, so my rating. This is one of my favorite movies, so I uh, give it you know five out of five. Even though I do recognize you know, that there are some issues, especially with like the ending and the way it all comes together, but you know, either way, I, I it's still one of my favorites, so I got to give it a perfect score. I, I give it a four out of five. I thought it was great. The ending, I thought was quite interesting, and uh, like that was the piece I was most wanting to talk about and and it actually left me thinking about this film a lot after the fact and uh it was something i didn't fully grasp uh especially right after watching but um i think the more you understand the more you can appreciate and it's uh it's one of those films where it's quite insane that it was uh, his first feature film because a lot of it felt expertly handled and there's there's so much interesting stuff to really absorb for this film so uh, I thought it was great and I, honestly I feel like after talking about it my appreciation only you know increased and uh, is certainly a film I, I'm probably going to want to watch again and certainly watch more Nicholas Roque. The next film that we're going to talk about, 1973, Don't Look Now, a horror film from Nicholas Roque. We have a couple lose a daughter in their home in America, and then we cut to them living in, is it Milan? Am I remembering that correctly? Uh, is it? It is. Yeah, I'm sorry. I was getting confused with this other rogue film I watched, uh, Bad Timing, where they're in Austria. I think it's in Italy. Yeah. So, in beautiful, beautiful city on full display uh, with great cinematography. And uh, the husband is working on a church. Meanwhile, the wife is seemingly able to come to terms with the tragic passing of her daughter after meeting two women, uh, two sisters, one of which is a medium and speaks to them about uh, their daughter in the afterlife. Uh, this is another film that has a impactful ending, one that is hard to wrap your head around, and uh, certainly, certainly interesting to say the, le the, the least. Um, Matt, what were your initial thoughts after watching Don't Look Now? So I watched this film for the first time probably like a, a year or two ago. And for some reason, like, I didn't fully remember it. I, I don't, I'm guessing I, like, what, stopped paying attention for some reason, but I can't quite remember. But on the rewatch, so it was kind of like watching it for the first time again. Um, it was like freaky like i didn't realize how scary it was and like now i can say for sure it's one of my favorite horror movies just because it's a horror film definitely at its core and it really freaks me out especially at the end yeah i i would have to agree i like as far as terrifying the the ending was legitimately terrifying i had actually I had seen the ending of this film and only the ending as well as another film that uh, Sutherland it's I, I hate to keep asking these questions. Uh, is it key for Suther Sutherland or is that the son of this leading man? Oh, it must. Is his last name Sutherland, the lead actor? I believe so. Oh, Donald. if that's his dad. This is Donald uh, that's, 
Uh, I didn't know they were related, but that would be super interesting because I'm very familiar with Keith or Sutherland. I, I used to watch that TV show 24 when I was younger. I used to, uh, I, <laughs> this is a just complete tangent. Um, I watched, I believe it was the first episode of 24. I was on vacation with my family. And I mean, li- this was the premiere and I, I'm sure you know as well as I do that that is a very old show now. So I was a bit of a youngster when it came out. And I had the first nightmare I think I'd ever had and remembered. And I still remember it to this day. Uh, we were on vacation with a family friend. They had a daughter that was my age that was staying with us. And in the nightmare, the daughter had eaten my mom as a hot dog and at that young age it, I w- I woke up crying and uh to that day that's how I remember 24 and uh stopped watching it after that <laughs> well that's a that's a funny way to remember the show yeah it, it is just one of those um you know save the day like <laughs> terrorist or attacking type of shows, which is fun when I was when I was younger. Um, so, so that t- side tangent completely threw me off, but hopefully, uh, you you, you got a, a kick of that. Um, this film, uh, are are you at all? I guess familiar with the Giallo, uh, the Italian kind of who done it murder, uh, mystery type horror. I'm not at all, no. Not really. So, um, like, one of the uh, four, like, grand, or not grandfathers, but, like, forefathers of it is um, the director of Suspiria, Dario Argento. Um, and, yeah. and Mario Bava, he's also another, like, really... Uh, impactful contributor to that movement. But Suspiria is perhaps the most famous example of that. And some other really good notable ones are Blood and Black Lace and Phenomena. And uh, sometimes there is like supernatural elements involved within it. And uh, this film, for its location, obviously, and also stylistically and the look of it also feels extremely, extremely inspired by the Giallo movement. Um, and I guess just for, if you have seen any Dario Argento, uh, did you, do you find that or do, do you kind of feel similarly? I, unfortunately I won't be able to talk about this because I haven't seen any of his films, but I have been meaning to for a while. I think we might have discussed almost doing an episode about him one time. But I've been meaning to watch uh, Suspiria and also Opera looked super interesting to me, as well as Phenomenon. Um, those were three that I could remember that I've been wanting to watch. But um, but yeah, right when you mentioned that it was an Italian kind of horror movement, I thought about Argento. I just haven't seen his films. Well... The one thing I will say, um, if you enjoyed this, I, I do think it's it's deeply inspired by it. And uh, because usually the the heart of it is uh, who is the murderer. And uh, oftentimes, like in Suspiria, which I think matches more closely to this, is there is a central mystery that isn't. Uh, exactly directly linked to who is the murderer, but like what is this kind of sinister entity? Like, you know, there is, there's evil lurking behind the surface. Um, and, and those two movies are just tremendous examples of it. And uh, trying to figure it out, what what's so good about this film and Suspiria is that you know there's something lurking behind the surface, yet you you don't even know what what shape 
or what form it is or, or what it's even like what pieces it's moving. And I think like that type of mystery was so interesting. It gives you enough information to stay engaged with the story, but just no idea where it's taking you. I found that to be thrilling in this movie. Yeah, that is probably why I, I, it it was so scary for me. Um, so I'm definitely very interested now in checking Suspiria out. I'm probably going to make that my next couple watches because cause this one really scared me. Um, and, you know, adding on to that, one thing that I, I think Rogue probably does well that uh, works, or I, I should say works well in this type of horror uh, format, you call it like the Giallo movement, um, is his the editing aspect you know that we talked about in performance how he kind of brings stuff back uh like i'm thinking specifically that picture that there's kind of i guess you say it might be blood on it that he's taking in the church and then it's kind of flashed throughout the movie at different time points and then at the very end you know at that climax it flashes to it and then i realize suddenly like oh my gosh it's that's like this person and then that specifically made me like super scared and like jump and like i was thinking yeah that's probably the the best horror the, the time i've been the most scared in a horror movie it out of all any i can think of just because of it, the buildup, I guess you could call it, like like what you're just talking about, how there's something lurking but you don't know, and it kind of is all building up to this point. Yeah, and in a sense, I guess one of the best uh, descriptions is that you could kind of call this a psychological horror, where it feels like the director is playing directly with the psychology of the audience. Um, you feel like there's any like uh, uh, an air of truth to that statement. A hundred percent. That 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 is what I wanted to talk about the most in this movie. Uh, uh, so a couple of things is that one, I didn't start realizing that they were cursed and bad things were happening to them until like the point where he's painting and it breaks and he starts swinging everywhere. I, that part freaked me out, and that's when I started like feeling this heightened sense of like something is seriously wrong, like what's going on here, you know, and then he sees his wife and them on that uh, funeral boat. And then he, you know, well, it starts when she, you know, falls uh, and hits the table in the restaurant, but you don't quite realize it then. And so that whole like build up was, was cool to me. And another thing uh, was, the way that he, like, tra- like the what the camera chooses to see and follow, and like this is in combination with the editing. Like the example I want to give is, I started noticing so much like red like jackets, like even in the scenes where you weren't supposed to see the little you know, not what's supposed to be their daughter running around. Um, like I just like I, I swear like he put the camera and lingered on like red like clothing for a little longer in some way to like keep your eye on it and to make you think and to like scare you a little bit. I, I that was just something I got that I thought was super cool from the movie and I was like, wow, this is like a, a true showing of expert uh, cinematography. I completely agree, and. I, I, with with everything you said, because I think Donald Sutherland's character is uh, supposed to be very representative of, uh, at least it felt very representative for my mentality as the film is going through, where I would be equally as uh, dubious to those sisters and their premonitions. I would, you know, write it off and say, I think they're trying to take advantage of a mourning couple. Um, And he is removed enough from it to never be able to, you know, face them with truly hard questions. But 
when the scaffolding or the uh, whatever you want to call it, it's like a, a, a cherry picker, but suspended via ropes. Once that falls, that is very much a turning point, like you said, where it's the, the oh shit moment that something has to be actually lurking and, you know, pulling the strings, no pun intended that there is an evil, I, I guess, against them. Um, and as far as the story beats, something I want to bring up is, like, this feels along the lines of, like, Oedipus, how it's almost the the premonition or, you know, the, the future telling is ultimately those interactions where you gain the insight that, uh, you know, your future is one thing almost seemingly leads it to become so. Um, did you kind of feel that way with this story? And did you find that to be kind of an interesting element? And also, just to pile on the questions, do you think he was you know, interested in doing a story that plays out, I guess, like a, like a tragedy, a Greek tragedy would like an Oedipus where that, uh, premonition works to almost keep the story working towards the, like what was like, predicted. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Cause you know, the whole idea is you, you're not really supposed to believe them at first, you know, because she, she does that and then or she gets she talks to them in the bathroom i think at the restaurant or wherever they were and then she falls and you think you know maybe maybe something happened or cuz she wakes up and and she's acting differently but then you know it, it in a way it builds over time because she suddenly believes that her daughter is alive again and he doesn't believe it but it's like he slowly um, still looking for her, and he still really does believe it. And so, he's. It, it, it's like, it, it's just an interesting take because you're not supposed to believe, you know what what the how it's going to play out. But you're right. Like it, it is a kind of a, uh, it does kind of hint at the what's going to happen the entire time. But you're still, I feel like as a viewer, I was still kind of hoping that, you know, I didn't expect it to be his daughter, but I didn't expect it to be what it was. So you're still kind of shocked at the end, but it's like what he is seeing is what turns out to be true. So it's like the, the fortune tellers were correct all along, which, you know, I wouldn't have predicted but i guess that's the the magic of the movie that's the like the horror aspect um and it i think what what goes or what part of the movie goes for uh, to show that what that thing you were just talking about the whole concept is when he sees you know the the funeral boat because that i think is another changing point in the movie because that's when he really starts believing something that it's like he flipped. It's like he was on the rational, real world side before, and after that, he he starts believing something that you know the officials uh, and and those people are telling him. You know that's not true. Like like that he's the crazy one now. Yeah, exactly. And uh, it also seemed like the paradigm shift shifted for the wife as well, where she had been uh, from the audience perspective my perspective was, you know, more delusional uh, of the two. And then after that moment, she seems more calm. She is accepting. And uh, he seems way more like, it just seems like they almost completely shifted roles after that point. Um, I found that to be interesting. And I think the the main theme being grieving and mourning was kind of well done from that perspective. And I think like part of what rogue was perhaps going for 
was that she was able to come to acceptance all the while Donald Sutherland's character was in a sense of denial. And once he was able to, he had this spring of hope because of the, the, you know, paranormal stuff that was happening to him. It ultimately led to his downfall, ironically. Yeah. Like it, it, you're right. Like it, in the end it turns around and, you know, it's not that she isn't maybe the the crazy one in the end because it, 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 to me it was like she got converted by uh, or like they the fortune tellers brought her into their group or something like that. Like they they changed her her brain, like the way it operates, which I think is kind of interesting. But yes, like it, he, his continued denial, but then every time you know he sees the red jacket, it's like a a big stop in the movie and he stops what he's doing and he has to go find out what it is so you, you know you get the sense that deep down he doesn't believe it or, or he, he does believe it's possible and i think you're right that that's i think like the best you know thankfully i haven't i, I don't have children so i couldn't have lost a child but that's never happened to me but from from what i've seen you know from seeing especially just being into true crime and seeing how victims' families react, they especially if someone is kidnapped and they're never uh, that's not the case here. But just a better example would be someone's kidnapped and there's almost no way they're still alive, but you still believe they're out there. It's that kind of hope that you see parents have for kids that have died tragically, uh, just probably because it's so heartbreaking. So, so that does kind of play into the whole horror and, and fortune teller at fortune telling aspect of the movie which i think is uh, it does it very very well yeah uh i, I want to make a i guess two two points in the first one being it feels like donald sutherland's character is a very accurate depiction of what i would describe denial kind of being like in real life um and certainly i think there is realistic cases where uh, people who are, you know, deeply affected in the mourning process literally can't even acknowledge the action that happened. But I would think maybe more commonly, um, what Do Donald Sutherland depicts is like a, a callous attitude where it's like, you just have to accept the fact, you know, she's dead. She's always going to be dead, but it, there, you know it's not an emotional acceptance, and you know that there is still... It's like he's brimming with emotion that he has to keep bottled in, and he can't comfort his wife because that would... That would mean he would have to let those feelings out, and he would have to go through and process all of those emotions, which I, I don't believe he had done up until the point that he actually thinks there is a glimmer of hope that his daughter is alive and in Milan. And that is what possesses him to chase her. Um, secondly, I also, I loved the aspect that, or I don't know if I loved it, but I thought it was a really interesting aspect that he was also supposed to be, kind of a mystic as well or someone who could foresee the future and how that played into the movie um matt what are what are your thoughts on that uh yeah so so i just want to say like briefly that i think you do get a sense that they're in denial or he hasn't fully gone through maybe his acceptance because they he you know he went to italy and his other kid is still back in the UK, which is kind of weird. But on your second point, um, I'm sorry, I I got so caught up in the first one. Can you repeat the second point again? Um, I I loved uh, how Sutherland was also a what do you call it a someone who could foresee the future. Oh right, yeah, yeah, and 
like I got this this sense of that character mostly because his I guess his work it kind of at least at the beginning when you're still like I was still kind of confused exactly what he does it looked to me like he was trying to solve this thing on his own or like he already I guess just the way the camera uh and the editing work it, it's like I I'm just thinking of that picture uh, that the movie kind of opens with, with the the blood on the picture in the, of uh, the church. And it kind of gives you this idea that he's seeing these things before they've happened. But the very end, like that one moment when it, all those images flash, I, I, that's like my favorite part before like the reveal of who's in dressed in the red or, or it's right after. I can't remember. Um, but when you see that flashing, you kind of see, all those things that happened in the movie that he he was kind of the center of those things that happened and they all kind of foretell or they they all kind of told you what's going to happen at the end but you don't know until the ending when it, it shows you all that so i just thought that that's extremely brilliant uh filmmaking and i think that that you know goes towards your point yeah like um it's in a way it's like it's a little bit reminiscent of like a uh a sixth sense where once yeah. something's revealed and you can like go back and and look at it through a completely different lens and uh the attention to detail that that takes is that that's really respectable cuz i feel like you you have to watch the movie like frontwards and backwards as a director slash editor to make sure everything falls into peace uh, or falls into place correctly. Right. Right. And I, uh, it reminded me of the, um, you know, it's way different because uh, I'm just gonna say the movie first blowout, which we discussed, you know, not that long ago. Um, that's different. Cause it's like y- you see the character acting differently, but here it's like, you can go back, like you said, and kind of watch it again and pick up on all of those points and and see how the ending all comes together uh, instead of maybe blowout where once you see all the points and you rewatch the movie, you just kind of see the whole thing differently, uh, like the whole way it plays out instead of uh, going back and like here and seeing, um, oh, like uh, this all does add up and uh, like I can... I, uh, the just the little hints and brief uh, flashes, maybe close-ups of an object or something happening earlier on in the film, uh, re- really like makes you realize how how great of uh, like the, the way the movie's pieced together uh, uh, it, it is is just very well done, and you don't really see that in a lot of movies. Not a lot of movies, I'd say, are, are really rewatchable in that way. Yeah, I I want to ask you, Matt, did you share this sentiment? I, and I think the film really does direct your mind that way. And I, I guess you would call it a classic red herring um, where the sisters I became very suspicious of. But I was most suspicious of the, uh, I guess, the do you call it a bust? It was like the head of one of the children that was their brother. And I thought that was going to be the, one of the reveals, you know, I, I thought that was going to be the central villain. Did you have that same sentiment or I guess just broadly, were you suspicious of the sisters or their family? Yeah. I don't know if this is the same person you're talking about, but I was really suspicious of, I think he was the same guy that you kind of saw following the uh, the main character around. And, and you also saw him in that little room or bathroom with the sisters when they were kind of telling uh, his wife uh, initially in that restaurant. He was just kind of sitting there or standing there in the hall like watching like, really close by. Do you know what I'm talking about? Was he a uh, police officer? Was he a detective? I think so. Yeah, I I think so. But like he he acted more like he like 
was there in the movie, but like they couldn't see him. Like he was like a spirit or something. Yeah. He, and well, let me ask you this. This is just because I think my memory's a little bit foggy on the exact details, but was that the same guy who was questioning Donald Sutherland when he made the police report that he saw his wife? Yeah, yeah, I well, okay, I'm not 100% sure on that either, but like during that scene I was trying to figure that out cuz he looked like him and I was and maybe that's just like the movie like doing that to you like making you try and figure it out, but I I thought it was him. He well, and also he acted really strangely and I could not figure out like he it was almost like very patronizing the way he questioned Sutherland. And then he had like, it seemed like he had an ulterior motive and I couldn't put my finger on it. hundred percent that, that I felt that same way. That's, that's when I started feeling more like, you know, Don Sutherland's character is the crazy one because he goes here and he, the guy's not taking him seriously at all. I remember that part. He's just like continuously stirring his tea it, it is like kind of like comical, like he was there as a joke. Like the guy, it was very strange. And I thought, is this whole town like conspired against him, or do these fortune tellers just like have a hold on everything? And you know, I don't quite get an answer at the end unless you just kind of think, you know, he was cursed, and there these were basically the evil people or spirits that were kind of surrounding him. That uh, that is a very, I think, reasonable explanation to everything, or at least uh, everything falls in line thematically, or you know, just it makes sense that way. Um, and and also, <laughs> they used or or the that detective used a piece of paper from a. Uh, someone who tries to sketch the face of the su- a suspect and it was oh, yeah. the, the murder suspect. And she's like, don't you need this and plays it off completely nonchalant. And, and everything about him, I was like, dude, this guy is not taking anything seriously. Yeah. I didn't qu- like that part made me laugh. I, but like it, because he's like drawing it like he's just like drawing faces for fun like it he couldn't care what it looks like at all he's just it's like he's there i i guess maybe that 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 was another part of the reason why i just thought the the don Southern's character was somehow losing his mind or slowly maybe like fading out of the real of reality and living now in this world controlled by uh, maybe the curse that was, I mean, I, I keep saying it's a curse. I'm not a hundred percent sure, but it just felt maybe it helps you give the feeling that everyone's conspiring against him. And it, like, like this guy is not even really an, a government figure. Like it's, it's like a joke of a person. Yeah. And I guess if you, if, if you were to attempt to tie that in, to like what seems to be the o- overarching theme of the movie, which is like you know losing a loved one. Like, how do you kind of fit that in? Because I do feel like, especially speaking from performance, Rogue shows really great brilliance when it comes to like fitting in like telling the story in a very interesting way where aspects are, they, they stick out for a reason. Like it's supposed to make a greater point about what the movie is about as a whole. And I feel like there is part of that in this film. I just couldn't, I don't know. I I was hoping to get your perspective and see if there was a little bit of that you were able to do. Yeah. So like if I, you know, think about this in like a realistic way, like, like not, like not just saying it it all happened because 
of a curse or because of this weird like paranormal activity or extra or like weird phenomenon going on and in the world of the movie i would say that that you could you could argue that um he's kind of in the way that we've been talking about how he's lost his mind and no one believes him anymore uh like think of and this isn't what he's going through at all but like it in the way that, say, someone who is a paranoid schizophrenic would think of people around them, how they're kind of uh, maybe scared of them, or they they think that they're taking them as a joke, or they think that they're all conspiring against them. And then you start seeing more and more things, like when he sees the boat, like when he sees starts seeing uh, what he thinks is his daughter everywhere. It, uh, stuff starts to kind of add up. And, you know, that's why you see these people saying things like they think government agents are following them. Like you kind of see that guy following him throughout the movie. Just an extreme, like, uh, disconnect from reality. And and the whole, like, it, it, it's kind of like the as the perspective of the characters changing, like – he works in these things that makes you as the viewer also start thinking like his character, maybe how he's like breaking down. And, and that, you know, is another, like my favorite part of the movie pretty much that I mentioned earlier, like the way he, he, he manipulates the cinematography and what you see as a viewer to kind of bring you into the world of the main character. I, I, I like that interpretation. I think it works uh, for the movie as a whole where I think it's, uh, you know, representative of uh, a break in reality. And uh, I do think that once he kind of opened the can of worms where he was open to the possibility that his daughter was still alive, it sent him on a self-destructive slash self-fulfilling prophecy. Um and I, I don't know if I've ever seen a movie do it quite as well on uh, is, is this one. And that, that was super, super interesting, I thought. And uh, just it put a, a really nice bow on this movie and made the ending super, super impactful. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I mean, I guess I just said it, but it's just the way he manipulates the viewer cuz cuz i think he does it better in this film than the performance just just probably because the themes are it's more scary so maybe it like engages you a little more like i felt a little more well like edge of my seat i guess is the best term to use in don't look now where you kind of just you want to keep looking you know you don't want to uh, you're afraid you'll miss something if you stop watching I gotcha. I want to kind of ask you, um, like, what elements of of horror made this work for you? Like, what what made this really frighten you personally? Uh, I've got to say, the, the number one thing was. I guess kind of how we you, we talked about in performance how he kind of feeds you little little parts in the edit that are you know forward looking and back looking and er, i don't know if back looking is the right term but anyways uh he, the way he i guess highlights certain things and then brings them back and reminds you of them uh works really well i think in a movie like this where you just it, it's not like you ever see someone haunting you or that there's not like someone there lurking that th the camera is alluding to at certain times. So there's not like a figure. And so I think the fact that that the whole terror is unknown, and then even at the end when you know it's revealed, you know who's in the red, like I still don't get an answer. So it, it like I stayed incredibly scared that after that after I saw you know when she or the, the being or whatever it is in red turns around and, you know, goes up with the knife and stuff. I was like thinking to myself, I'm, this is like going to, 
make me have like bad sleep. Like, I'm gonna have a hard time falling asleep because like this image is gonna be stuck in my mind, and it's it's scary. And I hadn't thought that about a movie. Like I I can't even remember the last one. Maybe one of the scary French uh, films, like like a. But but even then, like the, I guess it's the build up. It's you don't really quite know it's building up, and it catches you by surprise. And it's like the best version, I guess, of what you would call it a, a jump scare. Maybe it's not really a, a jump scare, but it scared me like a like a really good jump scare would. But at the same time, it makes the whole movie kind of come together. I guess. The, the, that's the whole thing for me. Like, like so, to summarize, it would just be that terror, terrorizing aspect. Plus, I come away thinking, you know, this is like a really, really well-made movie that that just worked for me. Yeah, I I think you you sparked like a number of of thoughts that I kind of want to like speak to as well, because I also appreciated them. Um, first and foremost is that this way this film has a great way of depicting like horror surrounding you and feeling like it's everywhere like that the horror is inescapable like that that there is a dark cloud following them um and that it's 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 truly not something that they can just run away from even though I mean, that would actually be the, you know, a option that would save them. But because of the murders that are uh, taking place and because of the feelings going on with their daughter, it just kind of feels like they're caught in this perfect storm where and all and on top of that, then the most important is the premonition. And that they feel like it's this inescapable thing. And they create that feeling for us, the audience, too. Because we don't know enough to know that we should zig when we should have zagged. Does that make sense? Like in a, a slasher movie, you're always like, well, don't don't go down to the basement, right? And, and maybe perhaps the ending is uh, a scenario like that. But I also think there's enough, enough like of a belief in the audience to wanting to discover what this is that I think a, at least a part of us is wanting to follow even if we know it's a bad idea. And that, I think, in essence, is what creates what you call... It's like it is a, a jump scare, kind of um it doesn't like use the manipulation that a lot of modern movies use where you know the noise just goes through the roof and something shoots at the camera but it's this reveal that feels so grandiose it just completely takes you aback and then before you know it this irreversible irreversible action takes place and it's quick and it's brutal and that in and of itself was terrifying. Like the feeling of being completely defenseless. Um, both of those aspects really make this film, it sets it apart for sure. Yeah, yeah. I think, you know, you just explained it way better than I did. I I think you, you've probably seen more horror films than, than I have. But uh, what you said of, that I think would explain what I was trying to say best was the the premonition part plus the fact uh, that it's not like another, other horror movies in the sense that you can kind of predict a lot of the times where the scary parts are going to come in the movie and what's going to be scary. Like you said, the slash film, like don't go into the basement, you know, don't go into the dark area. Whereas here, it's just kind of random. Like it happens... But you you really don't know it's coming, and even though the movie like gives you hints, it doesn't give them in a way where it lets you predict what's going to happen. It's still like completely unpredictable, which I think 
might be the most important part of of horror for me if if it's unpredictable and i don't know you know i can't be like oh well, you know so and so's about to get killed that kind of kills it for me so i think that you know to to remain engaged and, and really scared uh this movie just just played with that that part well being able to me not being able to have any idea what's going to happen next and uh like the more I discuss this film with you, the more I appreciate what this film did. And I have to say, and, and I, I wonder if you agree, it might be one of those situations where it's like, Hey, once the matrix did the matrix, you, you got to, you know, really put a deep spin on it. If you want to go a direction like that. But I, I, I guess I'm really surprised that the slasher genre didn't take a ton of notes from this film because it it hits certain story beats but it, it it does it from a narrative that you you're almost experiencing a heightened sense of horror that slasher films can achieve but it tells it in a completely different way where you don't even realize you're in a slasher film until the very end. It's like, it's, it's actually really genius the way they went about it. And, and to my knowledge, I, I, I can't think of another f horror film that's really done anything like this. Yeah. I was trying to think of that too, just now. Like, are there any other movies I could think are like this one? And, and not really. Cause I mean, the, just the the way it brings you in. I guess we've we've already touched on this, but like, as, as a viewer, you're scared too, and not just for the character. Like, I found that I was never really that scared for Donald Sutherland's character. Like, I didn't really, it didn't give you a ton of reason to like really care about him. But just the movie itself is is scary. Like, you're wondering what's going to happen, and. It's also like usually there are certain scenes I think in almost all movies like horror or not where they're going into that scene and, and you know it's going to be super important. But here I think the only time I felt that way was the very end when he's chasing you know the, the girl in the red the red jacket around. You kind of realize okay when he finds her like something's probably going to happen. But besides that it, it, it kind of all is is really building to that grandiose ending um but but throughout that build as you learn more and more like tons of scary and, and questioning weird things happen that just it kind of all culminates uh to to a great ending i i want to say another thing i think this film really did well was create like i think a, a fairly realistic um, atmosphere as to what it would be like to be in a city where killings are taking place. And I know we've spoken at length about this before, but I think it's worth mentioning for this movie. Uh, it's like, hey, if you're if you were in Boston when the Boston Stranglings, if you were in New York City when Son of Sam, if you were in Southern California during the Zodiac, I mean, that would be like quite a terrifying time period. But the, the, the nature of what the central couple is going through, it's like they have bigger fish to fry, which is probably quite realistic where, you know, in, the, in those towns being terrorized or cities rather, you know, there, there's something that you keep in the back of your mind, but you also have to go about your day to day, which is like, you know, it illuminates... I I'll say the banality of evil being allowed to exist uh, in a city yeah. during a time period, and it's it's really interesting to kind of see it depicted in this film. I think that's a great point. I I hadn't thought of that, but but like thinking about what I'm personally the most scared of, you know, it's things like you know someone breaking in or or like coming after me for whatever reason 
and and seemingly for for no reason like those serial killers you mentioned is probably the most scary because then you know you think i haven't done anything but i'm still at risk here to like die a horrific death and that kind of terror of uh, i guess it's the fear of maybe not the unknown but but knowing that uh, realizing that evil is all around you and you can't do anything about it and you're at risk of being a victim is you know something that people don't like to think about generally because you know if you dwell on that um then you're just gonna you know work yourself into being scared and paranoid all the time so it's like the in the same way here they're they're trying to you know brush away thoughts of their of their daughter who had just died recently but but even going to a new city or country altogether it's like it, it doesn't make it go away exactly um yeah i i really really appreciated this film matt i want to ask you any any other elements that you really wanted to highlight about this no um i i think i i said you know just about everything but but thank you for the argento recommendation if it's similar I think I've definitely found the type of, of horror movie that will scare me, which is what I've been looking for. I, I hope you, you enjoy it. I would definitely give it a shot. Um, I think Suspiria, like, you know, a lot of people really, really enjoy. That would be a good place to start. And if you enjoy that, I've seen Opera and Phenomena. I really enjoyed both of those, so... I think you got three right out of the the gate that you'll probably really resonate with. And it it is a really, really unique style. I mean, horror, like we said, this film is very unique, but also so are those those three from Dario Argento. It's just uh, so much to it, Uh, so much visually striking scenes, but also... The stories are just ambiguous enough to keep you entirely in suspense the whole way through, uh, which is really hard to achieve, and and Rogue does it uh, very well in this. I want to ask you, Matt, what do you rate this film? Yeah, so on the rewatch, I gave this a four and a half. I just, you know, I came away absolutely loving it. I was even considering a five, but I don't know. I just stuck with a four and a half. Um, just great horror film. I I gave this one a four out of five. I thought it was great. Uh, and it's another situation where I think talking about it and like really thinking deeply about what was done well, uh, it's something that it's like completely appreciated in my mind and and. You know, you don't realize the genius in these films, I think, until you really look deeply at them. I feel that way uh, a lot with this film. Um, Before we close it out, Matt, uh, because you've seen more rogue films, I I, I just want to ask you to kind of speak to his style and some of the elements that you really appreciated uh, in his other filmography that maybe gets highlighted in these two, or maybe even things that he's added to his his tool set, I guess, in, in the other movies you've seen. Yeah, I'd say his movies in general are very bizarre, and I think that comes a lot from the way he edits and pieces together different parts of the film and like as I've, as I've mentioned several times the way he flashes to different things that's all kind of present in his movies but they usually all also have this this weird kind of where the where the story and plot isn't super uh in your face or obvious you kind of have to get the themes out of it you know so so discussing it like we did can really help you appreciate the movie more but um Another one I recommend Walkabout. I think that's a great movie. Uh, I think, especially in terms of the visuals, uh, it's one of the best movies that has like a, a its setting is pretty much completely outdoors and in the Australian outback, I believe, and it just looks beautiful. So that's a great 
uh, highlight, or it's a great movie that highlights his cin- cinematography abilities. Um, and another one uh, that I'd recommend that I, is kind of like performance in a way, but I'd say it's like it in the sense that it's extremely strange, bizarre, and David Bowie uh, kind of plays a very uh, strange kind of alien character. Well, he he really is an alien in that movie. But uh, so you, it's kind of like another otherworldly sort of experience. So those are the other two I would recommend. But I think, you know, I think starting with Don't Look Now is a, is a great idea just because I, I think anybody can enjoy this, this movie uh, and, and be, and it'll scare pretty much anyone if they are paying attention. I agree. I, I think uh, this was a great director to recommend. I'm really glad that you did, Matt, because... He wasn't someone that was on my radar. I had, like I said, I think at the the onset of this conversation, Don't Look Now was a film that I had had on my watch list for a really long time without ever really taking note of who the director was. And uh, he, I think stylistically, remains very consistent, but it's not like he dedicated his career to the horror genre. And uh, I think in watching performance, it's easy to see that he can attain success in telling different stories because his style of tor- storytelling is so unique. Um, and there's not many people like him. And hopefully this conversation kind of uh, puts him on a lot of people's radars if if uh, if they haven't already seen any of his movies. Yeah. Well, Matt, I want to say thank you for joining me. This was a great conversation, man. Yeah, I I really uh, I had a good time talking about him. And, uh, like, I, I think this is a great... If you want to like study a, a director's style, I think he's so stylish and and uh, artistic that it's it's a great you know it's it's a great director to watch. So great conversation, uh, and, and I feel like you know having conversations about these types of directors, you can just learn so much more. Absolutely, that's all from us. Thank you for joining us, and we will catch you on the flippity flip. Bye, y'all.